Hello, glad you joined us. Good to see you here. Let me turn up this volume a little bit more there. There we go. Let's see how this works. Good to see you. We're glad you're here. Um, we want to welcome you if uh, you are joining us for the first time, uh, or if you're joining us as you've been in the past several months. It's good to have you with us. Be sure to um, uh, subscribe to this channel if you're watching on YouTube, or if you are watching on Facebook, uh, you can um, share this uh, Bible study to your page, or you can follow our Simsboro First Baptist Church uh, Facebook page, and that'll give you the updates <clears throat> as we continue to do our Wednesday night Bible study um, tonight. Uh, we've been looking at the last few uh, Bible studies have been talking about um, promises that God has made in his word. And we've talked about how promises are really based upon uh, what makes a promise. A promise is based really not on what is said as much as the character and the ability of the person to deliver what they say. You can make, uh, in other words, talk is cheap, but if the person who you are who makes the promise is one of integrity and it's a person who has the um, means to deliver, uh, then you take it to the bank. You say, hey, so-and-so promised that I, they would do this and so I'm going to do it because I know them and I know they can do this. So that's what we've been talking about. We've talked about the different promises of God and this week we're up to number four, which is uh, I will not falter. And of course, this is all based upon a, a book entitled Always True by James McDonald. Um, this is the fifth lesson that we're looking at. And the promise is this, God is always watching, I will not falter. God is always watching, I will not falter. Well, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean to falter? What is that talking about there when it says somebody says falter? It's not a term we may use a lot, um, but what does that mean? Well, the, the term to falter uh, and the dictionary means to lose strength or momentum. Um, it's to slip down. It's to go under. It's to give up. It's to give in. It's to lose the battle. It's to throw your hands up. Um, to, to say, you know, and it can be anything in life. You know, we falter when we say, you know, I, I'm done. Just, just stick a fork in me. I'm done uh, is the Southern way of saying to falter. And so one of the things that we know about about it is you know at some point you you try you do you work you, you toil you do everything you can and then finally you just say can't do it just just actually there we go there we go can't do it throw your hands up all right kind of looked like i'd lost an arm there for a second but anyway so again i can't you can't do it we can't do this i, I just falter i give up i give in I'm, I'm done i've lost um you know stick a fork in me we're done kind of thing. And that's what it means to falter. And oftentimes when we engage in life, when we're, when we're struggling in life, when we have uh, battles, when we have suffering, when we have hardships, when we, we have everything going on and, and everything around us is just weighing us down more and more and we fight and we fight and we try and we, and we do all we can and we just finally just feel the pressure so much that we just say, you know what, I'm done. I'm done. I just, I give up. How, is this something that's new? Is this something that we only see today? Well, uh, Psalm, one, Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 13, verses 1 and 2 says, David says this, How long, Lord, will you forget uh, me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I store up anxious concerns within me, agony in my mind every day? How long will my enemy dominate me? Does that sound like somebody who's on the verge of, of faltering, of, of giving up, of, of losing strength, losing momentum? Well, Psalm 74, 9, there is no signs for us to see. There is no longer a prophet, and none of us knows how long this will last. Again, we don't see any hope. We don't, you know, we don't see any positive solution out of this. We don't even have somebody to speak to us on behalf of God, we don't know how long this is going to last. 
Psalm 10, 1. Lord, why, uh, why do you stand so far away? Why do you hide in times of trouble? You see, what's taking place in all of these passages, David is writing, and, and he, as he writes here, he's encountered uh, battles and, and people out to kill him and, and hardships and struggles, and he sees the things going on in his among his people and how the, the Israelites are turning away from God and turning toward uh, humanism and selfishness and self-centeredness and, and, and all of the things that, that uh, being dependent upon all of those things and rather than being dependent upon God. And so because of that, David writes all of this and he says, you know, I, I just, Lord, I, I see all of this taking place and I just want to give up. I want to falter. You know, this another instance in the Bible where we see the same theme is in the book of Isaiah, where the children of Israel have turned away from God. And here's what the Bible says here in Psalm, excuse me, in Isaiah 42, 18, beginning verse 18. He says, listen to you, listen, you deaf, look, you blind, so that you may, so that you may see. And then verse uh, 22 says this, but this is is a people plundered and looted, all of them trapped in holes or imprisoned in dungeons. They have become plunder with no one to rescue them and loot with no one saying, give it back. So what's taking place here um, is that Israel has, is under persecution. They're under, uh, they've become the slaves uh, to a foreign nation uh, because of their sinfulness. And God says, look, you, you listen, listen, you blind people, or listen, you deaf people, look, see, don't you understand something here? He says, here's where you are. You, you, can't, t you can't even defend yourselves. People plunder you. They loot. They trap you in holes. They prison you, imprison you uh, in, in dungeons. Uh, you're weak as a nation. And then in verse 24, he says this, who gave Jacob to the robber and Israel to the plunderers? Who is not, uh, was it not the Lord? Have you, we not sinned against him? They, will not willing, uh, they were not willing to walk in his ways and they would not listen to his instructions? So he says, hey, look, Israel, where you are, you are, have become, uh, people are, are robbing from you, they're plundering you. And all of this that's taking place, all of this hardship, this struggle that's taking place, is because of you. You did this, and so because you turned away from me, I then am causing this to happen, God says. I'm, I'm doing this to bring you back to me. That's why you have this. And so in verse 25, he says this, so he poured out his furious anger and the power of the war of war on Jacob. It surrounded him with fire, but he did not know it. It burned him, but he didn't take it to heart. In other words, the people didn't listen. They didn't listen at all. So that's the context of what's going on. We see agony, we see struggle, we see hardship, right? But then look in the next chapter, verse 43, verse 1. Chapter 43, verse 1, it says, Now this is what the Lord says to Israel, the one who created Jacob, and the one who formed you, Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. So, so here's kind of putting the big picture together. Here's what's going on is Israel is, is in hardship. They're, they're being uh, overrun. They're being stolen from, plundered. They've gone to war. They've lost. They're now the, the, the winner has the spoils of war. Uh, all of this because of Israel's separation from God, their sinfulness, their refusal to follow, and, and, and God saying, okay, I'm going to let this happen to you. Uh, I'm going to let this take place in your life. And, and, and here they are. They're in this spot of just deep, deep trouble and deep, just ready to give up and just say, look at all that's happened to us. Poor, miserable us. Poor, miserable me. Look what's taking place here. And then God comes up and says this, in the midst of their sorrow, he says, I created you, don't fear. I have redeemed you. I've called you by my name. You are mine. You see, what, what we need to understand 
is that redemption is the greatest word in any language. You know, the, the promise that we have uh, that we're looking at this week, God is always watching. I will not give up. I will not falter. I will not lose um, the battle. I will not um, throw in the towel. Why? Why is that? Why? Because we, this is for believers, we have been redeemed. When Paul, the Apostle Paul, was in prison, as he was in prison, uh, I'm sure he was at times questioning, why don't I throw the towel in? Why why, why don't I just give up? Why don't I give these folks what I want? And the reason he didn't was because he knew that he had been redeemed, that he was a child of God, that he was God, uh, that he was God's possession. And, and that's what we're talking about here when we talk about redemption. The idea of redemption is an action, the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt uh, or the action of saving or being saved from sin, evil, or error. Redemption is, as, as we said earlier, the, the, greatest, um, the greatest word in any language because God says you think it's all over because you have trials, because you have problems, because you have pain, but I redeemed you, I redeemed you, what will I not do for you now? You see, what that means is this. If God has saved us, God became flesh, God died on a cross for our sin, God did all of that to bring us out of our sin to, to a right relationship for us, that if he's done all of that already, what else is he going to do for us? Or what would he not do for us is, is a better way to answer ask that question. Because we have been purchased with the blood of Christ, we know that God watches over us because he redeemed us. We know he watches over us. We know that no matter what happens in life, we're not alone. Why? Because God watches over us. How do we know that? Because he's redeemed us. And if he's done so much for our redemption to bring us out of sin, to pay our debt for us that we could never pay, how much more will he do for us because we're his? You notice again what verse 1 says of chapter 43. Do not fear for I've redeemed you. I've called you by your name. Not only has he redeemed us, he knows us. He knows everything about us. He knows our thoughts. He knows our hearts better than we even know our hearts. He knows our motivations. He knows more and more about us constantly than we ever will. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows the, the struggles. He knows it all. And notice he also says, I know you by name. And then he says, you're mine. You're mine. He says, I have bought you with price. You're mine. Look at what we see in verse 2 of chapter 43. When you pass through the waters, he says, I will be with you. And the rivers will not overflow, overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched. The flames will not burn you. What God is promising here is that he, we don't have to give up. We don't have to throw in the towel because he is there with us through it all. Not only walking with us, but protecting us. I love that it says when you pass through the waters, I kind of think of, walking through a, 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 not just like a little stream, but, but more of like rushing waters, crossing a, 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 some rushing water. You know, water, when you go across, across it, will carry you away. And it'll, it'll bring you down. When people used to, um, uh, in the Mississippi River sometimes, if you threw something in the Mississippi River at Natchez, before you knew it, you were already in Baton Rouge because of the swiftness of the water. And he says here, I will not, that he uses the life as a, as a water 
a river rushing through and he says i will not i will be not only with you but the river won't overwhelm you life won't overwhelm you if you trust me and believe my promise and when we begin to get anxious and worried and and fearful and overwhelmed we go to him and say lord i i feel all of this but i know your word tells me that you've got this so lord help me to trust you and he also says here when you go through or the fire walk through the fire you're not alone and not only that he's going to protect you there you know when i think about the fire there this reference here i I immediately think probably as you do to Daniel chapter 3 verse 15 the story of uh, Shadrach Meshach and Abednego and how these young men were servants of the Lord and they'd been captured and and the king King Nebuchadnezzar says to him hey you know you're gonna bow down and you're gonna worship me and when you hear these trumpets blast uh, you're going to uh, you hear the sound of the horn uh, the flute, the, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the drum, every kind of music, you're going to fall down and worship the statue that I've made. I don't want you worshiping Yahweh, the one true God. No, you're going to worship me. It says, but if you don't worship it, you will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who can rescue you from my power? That's what the king says. And so we know the story that the horns blow, the music plays, everyone bows down to worship the king except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so they're bound. They're bound. They're putting clothes on them to help them help the things burn a little, help them get a little bit more toasty. Uh, they throw them into the furnace. And as they're throwing them into the furnace, it was so hot. It says it was so hot that the raging flames killed those who carried them up. And then it says in verse uh, 23, and these, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the furnace of the blazing fire. In other words, it was so hot, they kicked it up a notch. And it was so hot that the guys who threw them into the furnace died from the heat. They weren't even in the furnace. They were just by, you know, by the furnace. They were thrown into, they th Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace, right? Y'all remember the story. So then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm. He said to his, his advisors, didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied to the king. He ex exclaimed, look, I see four men. They're not tied walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth one looks like a son of the gods. See, here we see the story of where God delivered. We know the story it continues on, and they call them out, and they Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all three come out. Their, their clothes aren't even, doesn't even smell like smoke. They're not harmed in any way. But here's the thing. When we think of this story, when we think of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we may think of it as like a children's story that we learned in Sunday school. But the reality is this, and the truth is this, that the same God who rescued Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the same one who is today. And it doesn't matter what takes place in your life. If God did that for these men, what is he wanting to do for you? What can he do for you? You see, I think part of the problem with us today, the reason why we are so willing to falter and give up, is because we think of this story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we think, well, that's a cute little story from long ago. It was a cute little fable. It's a cute little story, kind of like Jack and Jill went up the hill. We forget, and we'll say, oh, yeah, it happened. It was, it was historical. It happened. Yeah, it was good. But we forget that God says he's the same yesterday, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, today, and tomorrow. If God could do that, what can he do in your life? 
See, we need to understand and realize that God knows. God knows what's going on in your life. God is watching you right where you are and knows exactly your need, knows your desires, knows what's taking place for way before we even understand it. But the problem is, is that we, when we hear that idea of from the very beginning uh, here of uh, God is always watching, I will not falter. When you think of the idea of God is always watching, part of the problem is with this promise is we misunderstand what that means. God is always watching. We, we get this wrong idea of what it means for God to watch. We may think of it like a hawk waiting, sitting up on a tree, waiting to swoop down on a, on a prey, uh, watching and waiting for something weaker than itself to swoop down. And, you know, when I was, uh, came out this morning uh, to, to get my truck to come up to the church, uh, as soon as I opened the door, I heard this, this, this whooshing sound, this loud whooshing sound. I thought, what in the world? And I looked over in the back part of our of our property, and and we have a little there's a little old wooden red building that's falling down. That we're gonna either it's gonna fall down or we're gonna tear it down. But we hadn't got to that point yet. But anyway, I look over there, and there were probably eighteen to twenty buzzards. Some of them were sitting on top of that red building. Others were in the tree. When I walked out, it spooked them, and they all started you know, flapping their wings and making all kind of noise, you know, and, I th and the first thing I thought was when I saw it, I was like, well, what's, what are they waiting for? What are they watching? What are they looking? Something's fixing to die or something has died. If something pretty big because, because there's so many of them and, and they're looking and they're searching and they're looking for their prey. They're looking for their food. They're looking to feast upon something. I didn't see what it was. But sometimes that's the way people think about God when they think of God's watching, watching us. He's watching us like, like, a, like a buzzard, like a hawk, looking for something to devour, looking for something to harm. Or we may think about God, when we say God's watching us, we may think like a family member, like a family member waiting for us to, to fall so they can say, I told you so. Like God is just sitting there in judgment, waiting to see and so when we fall to say, yeah, I told you, I knew, I knew you'd fall. I knew you weren't any good. I knew you couldn't do this. I knew you'd fall in, in front of me. I told you so. And while God is a righteous judge and God does judge, the Bible also says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, as believers, as followers of Christ, we have been forgiven of our sins. So when we fail, God doesn't sit and watch for us to fail in order to tell us, rub our noses in it, or to say, you know, look at what you did. Now, now that happens, but it's not God doing it, it's Satan. Satan will sit there and, and shame us. God gives us grace. Why is it that God watches us? Why is it that he is looking out for us? Well, notice, here's what he says. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel and your Savior. I have given Egypt as a ransom for you, Cush and Sheba in your place. Because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you, I will give people in exchange for you and, and nations instead of your life. Why is it that God watches over us? It's because you are precious in his sight. Because God has redeemed you. You're not precious in, in, in his sight because of anything you offer, anything you bring to the table. Rather, you're precious in his sight because he's redeemed you. He's bought you through the blood of Christ. You know, when, when parents have children for the very first time and and, and right after they're, they're united for the first time, you know, the, one of the things that, that everyone does, mothers do, will do, fathers not necessarily as much, but some do, but mothers especially, they just, they examine every part of the baby. They look at all the toes and the toenails. They, 
They look at the every the knees. I mean, they look over. They inspect. They look over. Why? Is it is it because of they're looking for a blemish? No. It's because they're looking over their their newborn baby because of that maternal motherly loving instinct, that love that a mother has for their child. They're wanting to see everything and know everything about what's going on with the child. And that's the way God watches us. As a parent watches over a newborn baby, so God watches over our lives. And he knows what's happening in them. My prayer is that as we looked at this passage tonight, that God will remind you, number one, that you've been, that if you know Jesus, you've been redeemed. And number two, if you are redeemed, you are precious in his sight and he's watching out for you. He's not left you at all. Trust him. This week, I hope that you will try to memorize uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Some of you may have already Memorize this because of uh, us uh, doing the 2 7 discipleship class. Um, but uh, if you haven't done so, we hope that you'll try to write it out and uh, try to memorize it. Next week, we'll do our uh, next promise, our fifth promise, which is I will not fail. We hope that you'll join us. Be sure to um, uh, uh, invite some folks uh, to watch the pod, this this uh, this podcast or whatever you want to call it, um, as well as um, uh, share this and uh, and follow us on uh, subscribe to us with YouTube.